This viewpoint. Well, what a time it is in Idaho politics. Good morning and welcome into Viewpoint. Doug Pat Cash is off this week. I am Joe Paris filling in. The Idaho legislature winding down for the 2023 year and lawmakers, they pushed through weeks and weeks of budgets, bills and battles. And it was a major reset too this year. Following the November 2022 election, the complexion of the legislature, it looks significantly different with a new batch of lawmakers and familiar faces in new places. There's a lot of questions heading into the session. How would lawmakers interact? What would their priorities be? What would they accomplish? Well, we had a lot of questions heading into the session. We now have our answers. And joining me here this morning uh, to start off our show, we have Republican leadership over from the Idaho State House. House Speaker, uh, Representative Mike Moyle from Star, and then Senate Pro Tem Chuck Winder from Boise. Uh, good morning, both of you. Thank you for joining morning, us here on Viewpoint. Thanks for having Thanks us. For having All right, so to be completely transparent, we are taping this on a Thursday. This will air on Sunday. So at this point, the legislature has not wrapped up, but the conversations, they, they kind of remain the same. And I want to get both of your reaction. What are your thoughts on the session overall? Is this kind of what you thought it would be? Yeah, I think, you know, when you have a 50% turnover in the body, which we did in the Senate, you don't know exactly how everything's going to play out, but I think it played out pretty well. If you look at the governor's state of the state address and all where he started, the, I think we've been able to deliver on most of his uh, programs that he wanted. I think the legislature's done the things they wanted to do as far as uh, the uh, social issues and, and uh, budgeting. So I think all in all, it's been a really good year. And uh, first year as the House Speaker, Representative Moyle, uh, what are your thoughts on your first year uh, replacing now Lieutenant Governor Bedke? It was fun. I had a good time. House members hit the floor running. You know, we did some great things for education, roads, tax relief. We touched all the bases, and, and it was it was a learning experience, but it was enjoyable. I really enjoyed it. And as we touched on, you know, the, the legislature looked a lot different, even in the sense that there were familiar faces who were in the House, now over in the Senate. And starting in the Senate, there was a lot of questions heading into the year that maybe would operate differently. Did it feel significantly different this year with the new members? Yeah, I think it did. Um, Anytime you have, as I mentioned earlier, the 50% turnover, you've got a lot of new people trying to learn the systems, trying to figure out the process of getting things done. Uh, so I think it did feel different. Um, we probably heard more bills, uh, you know, of different types than uh, we have in the past. Uh, but all in all, I think it worked out pretty well, and the new people showed up and uh, did their work and participated, and it worked out really well, I think. What's your feeling on the new Idaho House with so many new members and the new speaker? I mean, it, it felt a lot different than last year. Yeah, it was, it, things went smooth. Um, good people, you know. The voters don't send us dummies. They send us good people, and they all came trying to represent their district. But no, things went a lot smoother than I thought they would. Uh, the House is more <clears throat> cohesive than they've been in the past, which is a good thing. Working together on some of the issues. Some of them, not so much. You always have those issues that we have the conflict with. But no, it went really well. All right, let's talk some of the business, property taxes. Heading into the year, I think that was probably the, the number one thing that Idahoans wanted. We've heard about it. We, we can't afford to stay in our homes. What are the legislature going to do about it? Property tax relief passes both houses. Uh, we'll start with you, Speaker Moyle. I know that you helped draft it. Are you happy with the property tax solution? You think you could have done more? Oh, well, I'd like to have done things a little differently, but that's kind of how it works in the legislature. You know, on the House side, the, the chairman threw out all the different ideas, and we all worked together to come up with a solution that included some stuff from our Senate friends and House members. And, and I think the bill that came out is a good bill. You'll see between 10 and 25 percent tax reduction on property taxes anyways, depending on where you live. I think it was a good compromise. We had a little hiccup there with the governor, but I think we got through that. And no, it, it, it was, it's a good compromise. It's, it's, it'll be helpful to the taxpayers of the state of Idaho. Senator, I know that there were some concerns um, from critics that say, you know, we, we get rid of the March election day at what cost? What are your thoughts on the property tax? Do you think this was a compromise? I think it was a compromise. I think the election day was obviously important to the schools, but they can still have their elections in May. I think, you know, they got a lot more money. We gave them a 16% increase in funding. Uh, we're trying to do the things to help them with uh, the things they say they need uh, for their teachers and pay. We're trying to figure out ways, which is part of the tax relief uh, that the uh, House put together, was that the uh, facilities uh, would get some uh, reductions of bond levies, the supplementals, so you can see property tax relief on that end, but that actually helps the schools also. And of course, uh, you know, education was a big topic this year, and there was a lot of talk going into the session about ESAs, education savings accounts, and, and vouchers. There's also conversation about Idaho launch. So, you know, here today we know that Idaho launch passed. The governor's very happy with that, as we've heard. But ESAs, it kind of took a back seat. And Senator, I'll start with you. What do you think happened with ESAs? Why do you think it, it didn't work out this year? Well, I think, you know, it started out that there was a huge uh, ESA bill uh, that probably would have been, you know, three, four hundred million dollars. Uh, 
that uh, was killed in the Senate because we just didn't feel we could afford that uh, large of a one. Uh, there were several others that were attempted, uh, but I think what happened was when the people didn't get the really big one they wanted, then they started killing the others that were smaller. And uh, that's just part of the political process that works. And, you know, I think you'll see it again. You'll see more effort to have funding follow the student. Do you think that was about the same in the House? Maybe a loss of appetite after the original idea didn't pass? No, I don't think there was a loss of appetite in the House. <clears throat> I think there was kind of a conflict because we had an education committee that didn't want to go there and, and, and wouldn't introduce the bills at the start. But I think toward the end you saw the bills get introduced. You also saw some other ideas come out with tax credits as a way to do it also. So I think, you know, the old saying that it isn't soup yet, I just think there wasn't a consensus of how to proceed. I think that the good pro tem brings up a good point. Everybody wasn't getting what they want, and so there was, they'd vote against one and for another one. You know, just that convoluted mess. But I think you'll see it, you know, congeal. I think you'll see something next year for sure. It's not going to go away. We're going to find a solution. Uh, we just got to get everybody in the room and let them fight it out and come up with a solution that they all give and take a little bit, like we did on property taxes. You just have to have all the ideas out there and let them decide which ones they like the best. And of course, uh, you know, st sticking with schools, uh, funding and teacher pay and investing in education. Of course, the legislature during the special session put away millions of dollars. Are you happy with what the legislature did for schools, or do you think there could have been more? Well, I, you know, I think we did a lot of really good things. Um, there was one effort uh, on the Senate side to use some of the endowment fund distribution money to set up a funding for bonding for school facilities. Uh, that didn't make it out of Senate Ed, uh, but I think it's a really good idea to use some of that funding, set up a permanent uh, source of uh, revenue to offset what the uh, locals have to do with bonding, and I think that gives property tax relief and it helps our schools and improves our facilities. Education yeah. conversation in the House is always <clears throat> difficult. What was it like leading it? Well, it was fun, but let's, <clears throat> let's talk about that a little bit. If you see what the legislature did this year with the historic funding to education, there's still some local control, though, so hopefully the locals do the right thing and give that money to, for salaries, for example, and don't move it around. But we did set up the mechanism with the property tax bill to provide a way that we can bond for buildings in the future without going to the property taxpayer. More money gets dumped into that side. We can get there where we do not have to have those, those property taxes to pay for those bonds. It'll come out of the sales tax. So we've set up a structure that'll help education going into the future. So we did some really good things. Of course, the Idaho legislature, they're going to make national headlines every year. And it, a lot of the time, it becomes about social issues. Um, you know, in years past, it's been abortion. This year, it's been health care and library content. In terms of the social conversations, do you think they were a distraction this year, or do you think there was meaningful conversations in legislation? I think there was meaningful conversation. Uh, I think, for instance, the uh, gender uh, caring uh, bill, the 71 uh, from the House, uh, got uh, national recognition. I heard it on the Today program this morning, and finally, it, I think it was reported correctly, and that is it really dealt with the parents knowing whether that uh, child was being transported or not. And I think, you know, that's where a lot of it came from uh, in transporting. I think the uh, gender affirming care, uh, we heard from a variety of doctors that said, some of these things they're doing now are permanent. And we just felt like, as a, as a minor, uh, that should wait. Uh, no surgeries, no long-term uh, physical impacts of uh, medical treatments. And we've heard from families that say we understand the surgery aspect, but w you know, we're really concerned about the hormones, about the medicine that our children are on. And I've spoken to families that say, unfortunately, I, I think we're going to have to leave Idaho. How do you respond to families that say we're being pushed out and you're, you know, you're villainizing our families here? I don't, I don't think that, that that's the case at all. I mean, they, they may feel that way, and I'm sorry they feel that way. But I think people need to remember the social issues that the legislature hears about are coming from the people that are elected. They're hearing from that stuff at home, and that's what pushes those issues. So I don't think there's anybody that wanted to harm those, those children, but they also didn't want to harm them on the other side by having the side effects later on in their lives. So I, I think it was a fair compromise on that. But I do want to emphasize on the social issues. The reason they come up in Idaho is because that's what people hear from their constituents at home and they bring them to the Capitol trying to solve those solutions. Um, of course, at the end of the legislature, we'll, we take inventory of everything that gets signed and passed by the governor, and then comes the lawsuits. Is there any concerns you have about legislation um, you know, that, that passed and is signed into law but has legal concerns now? We know the ACLU has a few on their list that they say, we don't think this is legal. Well, they make a living off from us. You know, they uh, go after us in lots of different ways on different issues. Some they win, some they don't. Um, I think, you know, our uh, effort is always to say what we do is constitutional until it's proven it's not. So I think, you know, a lot of these things are worth the fight. Uh, 
and uh, unfortunately, we'll probably have some lawsuits again, uh, but that's uh, part of the process we go through. And that's, that's a, a line that I thought was really interesting, worth the fight. I've spoken to Idahoans that say, I think these are worth challenging. I've heard others that say, I don't think these are worth challenging. I think these are legal. At what point, Speaker Moyle, is it worth the fight? It's always worth the fight if you're trying to do what's right. And that's the key. I think that all these issues are brought by people that are trying to do what's right. And so it's always worth the fight. So here at the end of the legislative session, uh, we'll look ahead to the second part of the session beginning next year. What didn't get done this, this session that you're hoping to touch on next year or you, know, you, you left it on the table and you wish you could, you could have gotten it? Well, I think the year. highest priorities for people have always been education, transportation. Uh, I think social issues have uh, risen to the top in lots of uh, areas of our state. Uh, so I think you'll continue to see you know, those types of things brought forward. We'll continue to look for uh, more ways to fund our schools and look at the facilities and how we fund uh, construction and bonding. So I think there are some things that will be out there. Uh, and there'll be some new ideas that we haven't even thought about yet that will come up. So. And you're going to see the debate again on the ESA stuff. We'll try to find a solution to that. Depending on what happens today on this library issue, that's not going away. So you're going to have those kind of issues that are there. You're going to see guys like me that would have preferred to see a little bit more tax relief. So next year you'll see me pushing, pushing for that and more of that because I think we could do more of that for a citizen in Idaho still on the upper end of taxes. But you know, all, those, all those things will come back. It's, just, it's, it's Groundhog Day. Well, we've got about a minute left in our segment. So before we wrap up, uh, what are you most proud of from this session? Well, I think, you know, just meeting the needs of the public, you know, funding education, funding transportation, giving tax relief for property tax. It was the highest priority coming in. I think that was a real successful story when we got through the property tax relief. Mr. Speaker, first year? First year, fun times. Loved it. Do it again next year. And, and the same. I mean, uh, we, did, we did some great things. If you check the boxes about what we talked about here at the start of the session, we hit almost every one of them. We had a very successful year working together, so it was fun. And bow ties will be back. Bow tie Friday, <laughs> all the time. Okay. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time here this morning. We are going to take a real quick break. When we come back, though, we have the leaders from the Idaho Democrats with us. They'll re respond to the Republicans and talk about the session from their point of view. Viewpoint returns right after this. At California Closets, every project is a personalized experience, custom designed, built, and installed by true craftsmen. We create exactly what you want, so your home office finally works for you. And the family room brings everyone together, even with the TV off. That's the California Closets difference. We call it practical magic. Start your experience with a free design consultation. Has your cable TV lost its spark? Do you suffer from the buffer? You deserve reliable TV without the hassle and the frustration. A-Plus Satellite is your premier local dish retailer, serving the Treasure Valley with reliable TV and real customer service for over 15 years. If you have Sparklight TV, switching to dish with A-Plus Satellite could save you over $700 a year. Stop in for a face-to-face -face with A-Plus Satellite at Fairview and Eagle, behind Krispy Kreme. Tommy Mello here, owner of A1 Garage Door Service. Springtime savings are here, and now is the perfect time to service your garage. Don't wait until a simple garage door repair becomes a major problem. If your garage door is noisy, if bugs are getting in, or if it struggles to open, your garage door is in need of a repair. Call A1 Garage today and receive the best service, best parts, and best warranty in the industry. Call today for our $129.99 tune-up special that includes a new bottom rubber. A1 And welcome back to Viewpoint. Thanks for joining us this morning. We are recapping the legislative session of the year 2023. Joining us here in our second segment now, the Idaho Democrats, Senator Melissa Wintrow, Representative Alana Rubel, the minority leaders respectively in their body. And uh, I guess for starters, uh, let, let's just take a look at the legislature. I know that in years past, it's been said this was the most dangerous legislature in the country. This is the most damaging session here in 2023. What are your thoughts? Um, well, uh, sadly, we kind of lived up to that billing and 
many ways again. Um, I felt for a lot of people in Idaho, it was really a full-time job to be in there um, doing battle against their government, just trying to protect their basic rights. They felt they, you know, many people just had to write, call, testify every single day to make sure they still had the right to vote, you know, by absentee or that they, that they retained their ballot initiative rights or that they tried to retain some shred of access to health care, parental control, books, libraries. Um, it really was kind of this, this nonstop assault on freedoms coming at the hands of their elected officials, unfortunately. How did it feel in the Senate? I imagine you have a similar opinion. Oh, very similar. And I think, you know, this is the year that the Senate really changed a lot after the last election and a lot of, you know, establishment Republicans lost their positions. And so we saw a huge battle in the Senate in the Republican Party where Democrats actually had to save a lot of the bills and budgets. Um, I think, you know, overall, I feel pretty shell-shocked by this session. I've been in the legislature nine years, and I don't think I've ever seen more citizens devastated and really upset. I mean, I got more phone calls from out-of-state reporters than, you know, local officials saying, hey, thanks for helping us. Um, I had calls from people everywhere that were deeply troubled by the direction that we're going in. And I think we are at a pretty um, troubling crossroads right now. And I want to talk about all those social bills that have been making national headlines from yeah. coast to coast. Real quickly first, on property tax, um, I know that there were some concerns about losing that March election date. I spoke to the governor this last week. He told me he had concerns about that as well. Mm -hmm. What are you hearing for, I guess, from education stakeholders about the damage that could do? Yeah, I think it's really concerning. It's unfortunate that we there was a very clean, good property tax bill that all the Democrats supported. There was uh, that House Bill 198 as amended, which was great. It had more property tax relief than what we got, and it did stick it to the schools by eliminating the March election date. Um, unfortunately, GOP leadership was not going to let that bill go through, at least not on the House side. So I think there is real concern. Yes, we're giving the schools some money for facilities this year, but the amount we're giving them is about one-eighth the amount that they need. So it's not like we've solved that facilities problem. We've just stripped away a critical tool that they need to solve that problem in the future. So I think getting rid of that date is really going to bite us and is going to be a serious problem for, for school boards. Yeah, and I, I, you know, just a little bit on that is I think what's troubling and what I've noted in the past is the legislature doesn't have a good track record of funding schools. And what we saw in the Senate this year with battles over education funding and vouchers and so forth, I'm really concerned about our public schools. And I think eliminating that March deadline or levy date was very strategic. It was very strategic on the part of many people. I know coming out of the special session last year with you know millions and millions of dollars that are put in a bucket for education, we'll say, okay, we'll see what the legislature does with it. Now that the session is basically passed, you know, what are your thoughts on the money that was put aside and how it was used? Go ahead. Um, on, on education particularly? Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very pleased. Most notably, it was critical that we fended off all of the efforts to bring vouchers to Idaho. Uh, there was just one after, after another to siphon money away from public schools and send it to private and religious schools. Um, amazingly, they were all fended off so that the money that is supposed to go to public schools is actually going to public schools. It's going to discretionary funds where it's needed. It's going to teacher pay increases, other classified personnel so desperately needed. I mean, I was fine special ed tutors who were quitting their job to you know deliver sandwiches uh, people that in my district that were shuttling over to Ontario to work uh, because the pay was so poor in Idaho schools uh, we were facing an existential threat point and I think it was really critical that we keep all of that money in public schools and I hope that it brought us back from the brink in terms of public school funding I know that uh, legislation that will likely end up in court very soon, the ACLU has signaled that, um, that the law that was signed in just last night by the governor, or excuse me, this week from the governor saying um, transgender children cannot get specific care. Um, no transgender surgeries for gender affirming care, uh, no hormones or puberty blockers for anyone under 18 for gender dysphoria. The, you know, an interesting part of the law is that you can still get those drugs if you're under 18, just not for the condition of gender dysphoria. Um, we know this will go up in the courts, but what are your thoughts right now on the message it sends to Idahoans? Uh I am so deeply concerned about this, more than anything else that was done this session. Um, this is a very small population. I mean, it's about 0.6% of the population that is transgender, and the youth, it's even smaller. So I guess politically, it's an easy group to beat up on. Um, but the damage is shocking to that group. Um, I've met with any number of 
<clears throat> kids who had actually attempted suicide. Uh, I met with three, three families specifically last week. Um, the kids had made very serious suicide attempts, ended up in inpatient hospital care because their gender dysphoria was so severe, um, and their lives were saved by these hormone treatments, which have been which have been dispensed for 30 years. They're very safe, they're reversible, and they are life-saving. And for these kids, I do not know what their families are gonna do. They're looking at selling their houses and having to move outside of Idaho. These drugs have an effect of reducing suicidality by 63%. And to tell families with severely suicidal teenagers <laughs> that they can't take the safe drugs that reduce their suicidality by 63% because their legislature has made a moral judgment that everybody needs to be the gender they were born forever um, it is cruel to these families and I, I haven't seen our legislature before take such an extreme step that is actually forcing Idahoans who have been here for decades to have to sell their houses and move out of the state just to save their children do you think lawmakers are listening because I, I I've spoken with families that say you know we went in to testify multiple times we explained in tears you know what this is going to do to our family and yet this was the end result and they asked me you know are they listening yeah I can't answer that do you think your colleagues are listening well I was on the committee that in the Senate for over two hours that um, basically took testimony from folks and you know heard from parents directly and kids and so forth there were more physicians there that talked about their prescribing of the medicines the safety the, the reversibility all of that people in Idaho most of the physicians uh, on the opposing the other side were out of state and from a very small group of doctors. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of physicians in seven organizations nationally that actually use the standard of care. And as you noted, we've been using puberty blockers for other things, precocious puberty. And we know they're reversible and safe and we continue to use them. We've chosen in this case not to allow kids who are feeling you know, not in, in their body correctly. And we're, we're basically limiting and oppressing that, this choice, right? And I've spoken with some lawmakers, you know, Democrats, that tell me, look, if, if the compromise here was that we'd say no surgeries, tran transgender surgeries for anyone under the age of 18, we could live with that. Would that still be something that a compromise to maybe look at in the future? Is that something that Democrats say, look, yeah. we understand your concerns, no we, surgeries, but let us do the hormones. We, we made that we made that presentation. So we had the bill on the amending order because of you know some other things they wanted to change um, in the bill, and there were two amendments. Uh, we proposed an amendment just that. Okay, eliminate surgery. We know that's not even happening in Idaho. Just make sure that these kids can get the prescription medications that are FDA approved, right? They rejected that. The other one we had was let's make an exception if kids are suicidal. If they're gonna take their life, and we have physicians and counselors that are there um, confirming that, then make the exception and let them have the, the, the drugs. No, rejected. Um, I, as, as Representative Rubel said, I think this is one of the most cruel uh, bills that I have seen. And yesterday I was on the State House step with a group of about 40 people who came to basically share with their government, you know what, you may have tried to silence us, you may have disregarded our voices, but we are here and we belong here and we're going to keep living our lives. Um, I, I hope that people who are going to leave this state change their mind and stay with us to fight this because I do think it's unconstitutional and I do think it'll go down in court. We're running short on time, but I did want to touch on the abortion trafficking legislation. And this is a term that I've, I've spoken with some of our viewers. They say, is this a new term, abortion trafficking? Long story short, the, the law would be that you, you can't take a minor out of state to get an abortion without their parents' permission. Of course, this will end up in the courts. Uh, what are your thoughts? Do you think this will hold? Uh, this is terrifying. I mean, we are going full on Handmaid's Tale with this bill. Um, not only do we have uh, probably the scariest abortion ban in the country right now with no exception for women's health, no exception for fatal fetal anomalies. You have to carry a fetus that has no skull or no spinal cord to nine months. Um, we have our, our laws are a catastrophe right there right now. They weren't fixed at all. Um, but to now say you can't even leave the state um, to get a pregnant teenager who may be a rape or incest victim, there was no exception for rape or incest. There's no exception for medical emergencies. Um, so we are further endangering, I think, the, uh, the females, the women and girls of this state. Um, I certainly hope that this goes down. And even, even Justice Kavanaugh, in his opinion, uh, said that he did not think it would be legal to ban interstate travel for abortion. Um, so we're going, I guess, several Several steps further than even Justice Kavanaugh was willing to go um, by the GOP supermajority now banning travel out of state for minors to get abortions. Senator, final thought? 
Well, on that note, I think um, the other thing that's really deeply troubling to me is that they were using charge language of abortion trafficking. We had a bill the week prior that was about human trafficking, and we know what human trafficking is. It's trapping, exploiting, oppressing, et cetera. This was a way to use charge language to try to get people to go for it. I think it's, uh, I think it's reprehensible to do that. Well, thank you, both of you, for joining us this morning. Our segments fly by. We'll have to, of <laughs> course, have you guys back soon to chat. Uh, but uh, Senator Melissa Wintrow, Representative Alana Rubel, the minority leaders at the State House, thanks for joining us. We're going to step aside real quickly, but we will wrap up Viewpoint on the other side of this break. Thanks to Les Flog Tires. I'm a confident vaccine driver, but mine's a little stressed about spending. Remember, deep breaths and watch your speed. Even though we're watching our wallets, Les Schwab is still watching out for our safety. So it's right here. During our spring tire sale, we watch out for your wallet too. Save up to $175 when you buy select tires with financing. Les Schwab Tires. Do you listen to the TV on high volume or have trouble hearing conversations? Then you would benefit from hearing aids. Don't waste thousands on expensive hearing aids when you can get Nano's revolutionary technology for just $297. Don't be fooled by higher priced hearing aids. The CIC Recharge is a true hearing aid, not an amplifier. With rechargeable technology many customers say is superior to more expensive models. Call now and get not one, but two Nano hearing aids for just $297. $97. Plus, we'll add a portable charging case and ship your order absolutely free. The CIC Recharge has a tiny in-the-ear canal design that is nearly invisible. Why keep missing out on important conversations or waste thousands of dollars? Call and get two CIC Recharge hearing aids for only $297 and free shipping. 800-852-0091. Again, that's 800-852-0091. Make your first move with battery power made by steel. Right now, save $50 on the FSA 57 battery trimmer. Real steel. Find yours. Well, thank you so much for joining us here this morning on Viewpoint. And as the legislature wraps up, we are going to have full coverage, reaction, and really looking ahead on our website at ktvb.com. If you ever miss an episode of Viewpoint or you want to watch it again, you could always check it out on our website or on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great week. We'll talk to you next time.